All right, we are live. Hello to those of you who are joining me today. Um, in this video, we're going to be painting a daisy together, which will be super fun. Hold on, let me adjust my camera here real quick. Um, so this is the last, well, this is the second to last day of our October flowers challenge. Um, if you've been participating, you know that, but tomorrow we're going to do a pick three. So I'll choose my three favorite flowers from the entire month and come up with a composition using three. But for today, uh, yeah, we're just doing a daisy. So I'm going to do this Gerbera. I think that's how you say it, a Gerbera daisy. And I linked it below. Uh, I linked it, it says reference photo for this painting and it's from Unsplash. So it's a copyright free image that we can use. And yeah, so I think there's something else I was going to say before I started, but oh well, this is what happens when it's live. Um, okay, so I'll talk about supplies really quick. I am using a Dustling and Heart sketchbook. I was thinking about doing a quick little sketchbook tour and going through all of my past, like the past month, but I think I'm going to actually do a YouTube video next week where I just do a sketchbook tour. So I'll do that next week. Um, um, I'm using a F pencil for my sketch because these are awesome for erasing after you're finished painting. I'm using these two um, Infinity Art Brushes by Fibonacci and I need to make sure to link her below. Uh, but they're great. These are brand new brushes, so they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're so great to work with. I love working with <laughs> new brushes. I always forget how great it is to work with brushes that aren't all old and splayed everywhere. Like check out this, uh, this is a, uh, this is a great brush. You can't even read it anymore. That's a Winsor & Newton, um, uh, Series 7 brush, but it's just so splayed. I need to do something about that. <laughs> Anyways, um, paints, um, I have entirely Winsor & Newton paints here. The color that we're going to be mixing today, I used a mixture of yellow ochre, cadmium red, and a little bit of um, alizarin crimson. So before we paint though, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the sketch. So I'm pulling up my reference out of frame here. And I think for this painting, for almost all of the ones I've done in this entire month, I have always done like a stem and leaves, maybe a butterfly, <laughs> but I want to keep this one. I think I'm going to actually just do the daisy. It's going to be a little bit, maybe a little bit uh, tedious, monotonous. Both of those words sound really bad, but it's going to be just kind of a lot of doing the same techniques over and over. And we're using, you know, just a couple of colors, but it's going to be a really great study. So. I will start by just drawing a center circle, kind of place it in the very center of my page. And so these Gerbera daisies, and if I'm saying that wrong and you know I'm saying it wrong, you should tell me how to say it, but I think they're called Gerbera daisies. Um, but they got a, t a bunch of teeny little, um, little tiny petals in the center. So I'm just gonna do a few of them. I don't think I'm gonna do it super detailed. A lot of times when I have to do like heavily detailed parts that are really small, I will wait till I'm actually painting because I find that, I don't know, if there's just too much going on with pencil, it's it can get a little messy and cluttered and I can't really see what I'm doing. And so I would rather just kind of keep it, like here's generally where the details go, but with my paintbrush all I'll add all the little tiny details. Yeah, this does have a lot of details. <laughs> oh my gosh. We're gonna do our best, you guys. So just moving around it, adding little, little teeny petals. The petals are gonna get bigger and bigger. Um, this was kind of a last minute live video today. I woke up this morning. I was like, oh yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> I usually post YouTube videos on 
Fridays, but um, I have been a little out of it lately. Just have had so much going on. So thank you guys so much for joining, even though it's a little bit last minute. I'm very honored that you're here, and I, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you're creating with me, and even if you're not, I still hope you enjoy it. So hopefully you can see this pretty well. Um, these pencils are very, very light. Um, if you're using like a number two pencil, you can see your detail a lot better. But as I said, these are great for watercolor specifically, so. Okay. Let's see if I can hold it up for you just a tiny bit. Can you see that okay? So, got our center kind of mapped out. And I will leave that part for now, I think. And I'm going to move on to doing some of these petals. And so these petals, I want you to just be mindful that whenever we do, this is a very symmetrical looking flower, but we never want our petals to just be one next to the other, you know, just like right next to each other. It feels really natural when they kind of overlap each other, when they're a little bit spaced. We just, I'll show you what I mean, but we just want to keep it feeling, we don't want it to feel too, um, too perfect, too geometric, if that makes sense. All right, so that's kind of the shape of a surfboard, I guess. <laughs> a long fingernail, I don't know. So I have one petal just behind that one. And then I'm going to go just a little bit over and have this petal here so it doesn't feel too, yeah, it doesn't feel too stiff. And now I'm going to give it a little bit more space and just try and be really consistent with your shapes. Sometimes I find that to be difficult as I go around. Sometimes they'll start getting longer and longer or pointy, a little more pointy. So I just kind of always look back to the first petal I did and just use that as my... Um, as my reference point. Put this one right next to that. I am, I, I did a, um, I'm, I'm sure that you are here just because you saw on Instagram that I was doing this, but um, I did a little poll to see which daisy y'all would want to paint with me and you guys chose the one I wanted to do, which made me happy. <laughs> I wanted to do this orange one, um, only because uh, most daisies are white, and white flowers are great, but it's just a little bit more of a time-consuming and a little bit more challenging. But if you're disappointed, I'm actually going to be teaching a class through Michaels the beginning of December, michaels.com. Um, it'll probably be available to sign up for in the next couple of weeks, but I will definitely post that in my in my you know, everywhere. <laughs> but um, I'm going to be doing a video or class about um, painting white flowers. I'm just giving you all my tips and tricks. It's a little bit challenging to paint white uh, flowers when, you're, when your base is white. You got to work very slowly. You don't want to make it too gray. I feel like that's always the that seems to be the most typical problem when people paint white flowers is they make them too gray. Um, but we'll talk about that next next time. But, but today we're working on something a little more pinky orange, which will be really fun. I'm definitely moving kind of slowly here. <laughs> Kind of looking back at my reference. I don't think, that, this is definitely not exactly like the reference, but also if you're looking at it, you see that there's a little teeny ant nestled in the petals, which is kind of fun. I don't think I'm gonna paint that though. <laughs> I don't think ants are very romantic bugs. Maybe if it was a little uh, butterfly or a bee or something. Okay, 
So you can see that you know some of them are overlapping, but there's also some nice space there. So now what I'll do is go in behind those and we're gonna just kind of fill in the empty space. It looks to me like this, um, uh, the petals in this are like two to three petals deep. If you're looking at the reference, you understand what I'm saying. In some places you'll see up to three layered and then in some places you just see about two layered. So. I don't paint very many daisies, so this is fun. I don't paint very many orange flowers either, actually. As I was mixing this color earlier today, I was like, yeah, I definitely have not used this color this month, so this will be fun. Hmm, let's see here. And I'm looking at the reference again. It does look like some of these back petals actually go out a bit further. So they reach out further. So they're not just all in the same plane. So I'm going to just extend some of these just a little bit. I'm glad I caught that. And I'll use my eraser. I keep my erasers in a little Altoid box. <laughs> little uh, bloom eraser. And it just lifts that, those lines out so quickly. I love a good eraser. <laughs> One of life's little pleasures. helps that this like I said this pencil is this pencil these pencils are made to be erased the F pencils so it's very easy to lift up whatever you draw if you end up not liking it or wanting to change it and I'm looking over at the chat hi hello hi hello hey <laughs> thank you guys for being here and thanks for saying hi It's so weird because on one hand, I just kind of feel like I'm sitting alone in my office talking to myself. And then I look over there, I'm like, oh yeah, there's like people watching this. <laughs> I, uh, I really like doing these live YouTube videos. Um, I've done, you know, the classes with Michaels, which are also live, but those ones are so much more stressful because <laughs> there's like, I don't know, there, it depends. there's a spectrum of how many people are usually in those, but Sometimes there's like six, seven, eight hundred people in them, so this just feels a little more relaxed, and I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, it is always interesting because when you're just doing live videos, painting, you kind of just feel like you're sitting by yourself. Okay, so I'm doing these kind of final details back here. I am taking forever with this. <laughs> but a good sketch is, is important. It's okay to take your time here. I'd rather take my time sketching and then speed go you know speed through the painting process than the other way around. This is the bones of the painting. You know what I mean? This is like the skeletal system. You you gotta make sure it's right. Okay, um, Taking it in real quick. A few more spots where I just want to make it feel a little more balanced. Okay. I like it. So let's go ahead and start adding some, let's start adding some color. So I think I will start by doing, I'm gonna do an underwash <coughs> um, of yellow ochre. So a really light layer, I'll go ahead and just um, wet this entire, entire flower. 
So this will be a wet on wet wash. So wetting the surface just so that whenever I bring over that paint, it'll just lay on super smoothly. Also this little cup that I have here in frame, it's so cute. Uh, my great grandma made that in the 60s. It has a, a little, um, it, it's like a sugar bowl and it has a little milk pouring thing that goes with it. So she made it as, you know, to pair with your coffee. But uh, I had a plant in it for the longest time, but then the plant died. So it's like, you know, this, is, this would be a great little water jar. And my, that grandma, she was very talented. She was a painter and a ceramicist and a musician. <laughs> And she made jewelry. But uh, yeah, I love having her pottery. It's so cool. I love all my ceramic goods. And I should mention, I get asked about it a lot, but this palette here is made from Sylvan Clayworks. And she does small batch ceramic palettes. And they are definitely hard to snag. So her, I think her last update, she sold out in like 10 minutes which is pretty unbelievable. Um, so yeah, if you want to get one of these palettes, you got to get on her mailing list and you got to be ready to pounce <laughs> whenever it's time. Okay, so back to that yellow ochre or whatever yellow color you have. You don't have to use the exact same colors as mine. Um, I'm just going to drop some of that color all over, all over this. And we'll give it a nice kind of warm um, under layer of paint. Uh, Catherine asked me what the difference between using a ceramic palette and just a normal palette? What's the difference between using porcelain or just normal ceramic? That's a great question. I'm actually not really sure about that. I would maybe guess you want to use something... Well, I, I don't think it would actually really matter. I think you just want something that has a very smooth surface and I believe that once ceramics or porcelain, once it gets fired in the kiln, it creates a surface that is essentially glass so it's very very smooth and so to me as long as it's smooth it's it works fine <coughs> excuse me I got a little throat tickle today but um I've used like glass I've used plastic ceramic um I don't know kind of just comes down to perf personal preference I just I love the way this one looks it makes me feel really inspired because it's so pretty so okay um, <laughs> I'm gonna drop a little bit more yellow of that yellow ochre around the center here because these inner petals are definitely more of a yellow Color, and then the outer ones have more of that very rich peachy orange color. Okay. Okay. Just making sure I have not missed any spots here. So I want this to be a very even layer of color. Okay, so I'm going to let that dry for just a minute. Um, Shelly asked, or said, if, if I noticed if I use anything other than watercolor paper, it wrinkles a lot. Is your book a watercolor paper book? Um, no, it's actually not. This is, <coughs> this is a, um, this is mixed media paper. So it takes watercolor reasonably well, um, but it's not as thick as watercolor paper. So it does buckle a little bit. And the more water you use, the more um, the more your paper will buckle. Um, let me take a drink of water real quick. Um, 
Yeah, I, I typically do use watercolor paper just in general for like commissions and all that good stuff. Um, I use 140 pound watercolor paper, which just has to do with <coughs> the way it's pressed. Um, this is quite a bit thinner, but because it's in a sketchbook, I'm not super worried about it because like just as the book is closed for a long time, uh, the paper just kind of stays flat. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always really disappointed. I, I don't, it's not much, it's not as much of an issue anymore, but there's been times where I've done original artwork, you know, commissions and the paper buckled a little bit and it makes me feel really embarrassed and it's not what I want to be sending to clients. So yeah, using the best quality paper keeps it from buckling and then using paper that is um, either taped down, which I, I do pretty frequently. I'll tape it down with masking tape or like to a hard surface like um, a block of wood or gator board. Or I will use paper that has the edges all glued together. So that keeps it from buckling. So a lot of information, but <laughs> thanks for that question. Okay, so I, let me, let me get a feel here. I don't want to start working on this yet because it's still a tiny bit wet. Um, so I'm just going to give it another second. Um, let me know in the comments too if you are painting this along with me or if you're painting your own daisy today or if you're not even painting at all. <laughs> um, let me see if there's any other questions I missed. Good idea, thank you. Hi Sandra. Thank you guys so much for joining me. This is so cool. All right, no questions, so I'm just going to start getting my color ready. So I mentioned earlier that I used a little bit of yellow ochre, um, cadmium red, and alizarin crimson. Uh, you probably don't need to use that many colors. I kind of was just, I kind of kept throwing stuff together until I was like, yeah, that feels right. <laughs> but yeah, this actually does feel like a very nice color. I wanted it to be like a very pinky peach, but kind of desaturated color and that yellow ochre mm, it's the best for that because it's a very warm kind of brownish yellow I love yellow ochre also if you're curious about the colors I can't live without it would have to be yellow ochre burnt sienna oof, sap green or olive green I love them both and then alizarin crimson I use alizarin crimson like every day <laughs> Um, <coughs> um, Clara says, I found if you tape down your paintings, uh, you'll, and leave it for 24 to 48 hours, it will get rid of most of the buckling and warping. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that does help. I, I've sometimes laid, you can tell right here, <laughs> there's got, a, there's a lot of buckle right now, but it's also wet. So it's going to, cause look at this one. This one's a lot more smooth. Um, but it's, while it's wet, it's going to be at its most buckled. Um, Sherry says, I'm watching while I work. I love that. Um, oh, Catherine, that's a great question. Catherine asked me, what's the best watercolor paper to use for scanning for prints? Um, my hot press paper looks too textured when I scan it. So um, I would maybe try a different type of hot, um, uh, hot press. Not all hot press is... <coughs> as smooth as it should be um, but hot press is definitely where it's at when it comes to uh, scanning your artwork there's always a little bit of editing I have to do it's kind of just the nature of it but my, my gosh cold press though I got a little cold press sheet here I don't know if you can tell but look at that texture do you see how how kind of rough it is that is very hard to remove when you take it into Photoshop and you're trying to get rid of all that white background, it's kind of a nightmare. So yeah, <coughs> gosh, I don't like that this cough just showed up as soon as I started talking today. All right. So I think that this is probably fine. It's still a tiny bit damp, but I think it's good enough. So um, I'm going to start. <laughs> I'll start up here at the top and I'm just going to drop this color back in here 
and then I'm actually going to grab, I'm gonna grab another paintbrush. From, I want one that's about the same size. So I'm using my Series 7, I think this is a size 3. So using a damp, using this brush, just damp, I smooth that color out. And you can see why I wanted my, um, my paper to be dry. Um, I just want to work on one petal at a time. So if the paper's too wet, it's going to take that color and just bleed it everywhere, which is not the worst, you know, because it's all going to end up being a pretty similar color anyways. But I do want the tips of my petals to be just a little bit lighter. Um, and then as you get closer to the center of the flower, or the bottom part of these petals, I'll, I'll have them get a little darker. You see what I'm saying? So it's a little darker over here, slightly lighter out towards the edge. And I'm just going to keep on moving around. So this is the part I mentioned that is a little bit tedious. A little bit, um, yeah, kind of redundant. You sort of do the same thing over and over. This is the part where I would put on my favorite show and just zone out. <laughs> or put on a good book. I've been on a, uh, I feel like I go through waves. Sometimes I like really just want to watch TV while I paint or just have a show on that I love. And sometimes I just want to listen to like really, you know, like self-improvement kind of, you know, personal development books or podcasts. And then sometimes I just want to listen to music. So I always just kind of go with, go with what my intuition is and trust that, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you guys relate to this, but I feel like sometimes if I push too much, uh, like educational type of books on myself, it ends up making me just feel kind of overwhelmed. I have to really be in the headspace where I'm like ready to absorb knowledge and learning. And if I'm not in the right headspace, it just makes me feel really burdened. <laughs> I'm kind of just bouncing around from pedal to pedal here. Not much of a, there really isn't much of a system to how I'm doing this. Make sure to maintain just a little bit of that lighter yellow color at the edge of some of these um, petals. If you have your reference uh, with you, you can see, if you have it pulled up, you can see that the edge of these petals are kind of more of a yellow color. Um, Sandra asked me if I use other brands of watercolor besides Windsor and Newton, or if I've tried them. Um, I found that Windsor and Newton is very difficult to re-wet for the 12 pan set. That's interesting. I'm not really sure if I've ever had that issue exactly, but um, I don't know if I've ever experienced with other pans of paint besides um, like Crayola, <laughs> like just some of the cheaper stuff when I was first starting. Like I would just use kind of some cheap stuff that I'd find at like Hobby Lobby. So going from Crayola to Windsor Newton pans, I was like, whoa, these are incredible. Um, as far as nowadays, I have some Daniel Smith. I have a tube of paint from Daniel Smith called Deep Sea Green. That is actually right there. But... Um, was not my favorite but of course that was just one color and all colors are a little different even within my Windsor and Newton they don't all feel the same I'm not really sure why that is it might just have to do with like the um the chemistry and the components that make each color um I'm not super knowledgeable about that world but yeah I just I really enjoy the uh the tube paints and I like just kind of wetting them as I need them the pan paints are 
I, li I liked them a lot for getting started. Um, I found that they kind of destroyed my brushes a little bit after too much use. That's kind of why it's one of the reasons I prefer this because you can kind of just, I don't know, rub it onto the palette instead of just straight down into the well. So sometimes it kind of, I think it kind of messed with my bristles, especially if I wasn't taking good care of them by like, you know, washing them <laughs> and shaping them, pointing them afterwards. But I am a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> I am a little bit of a purist about Winsor & Newton. I've just, I don't know, I've just loved their paints so much that I haven't really, I haven't even really wanted to experiment with other stuff very much. Um, not that I can think of, really. I do have some Crayola colored pencils, though, so. <laughs> um, actually, though, Windsor Newton is sending me some uh, watercolor pencils this week to try out and post about. So that'll be fun. It'll be fun to experiment with those. I hope I like them because <laughs> I told them I would post some photos and hopefully I can create some stuff that I actually like. But we will see how that goes. Hmm. So remember, watercolor always dries a little lighter than you expect. So in some spots, I probably need to drop a tiny bit more color. Um, let me read a couple of <coughs> questions here. Uh, oh, Catherine says, I followed your Arttober list and I love it. I use ink and it has helped me a lot to practice with flowers. Um, I love that. What do you, do you also paint at night? What type of desk light do you use to have the same visibility as daylight? Would be nice to see your studio tour in the future. Um, yeah, I... I was thinking I should do another studio tour pretty soon here. I change it like every day in here, so I'm always just like waiting to like have it totally honed in and then I'll do the tour or just having it have it totally organized. Like right now it's it's like the outside area and like the main area is nice, but in the closet gets so disorganized so quickly <laughs> it kind of drives me nuts. Um but as far as painting at night, um I used to paint at night more. I don't anymore. I don't think I've painted at night probably in, I don't know, <laughs> months if not years. Um, I don't know. I just kind of, I, I don't like it as much. I feel like I have a really hard time seeing the colors I'm using. Um, but I do have some lights above me for, you know, if, if I ever need to, or, or if it's ever a cloudy day, uh, which does happen. So I have some lights above me. I have like a track light. I think that's what it's called, but it's like a set of three lights and I have daylight bulbs. So the Kelvin is like, oh my gosh, I think it's like 5,000 Kelvin. So it's not as warm. It's actually a bit more cool. There might be one bulb in there that I had warm. Um, it's tricky, though, to simulate <laughs> daylight with artificial light. At least I don't really know a whole lot about that. I know a lot of pa painters who do um, that kind of stuff. There's an artist I follow on YouTube called uh, named Andrew Tischler, and I know he talks about great studio light because uh, he works with, like, controlled light, so he doesn't rely on natural daylight. He relies on his studio lights. Andrew Tischler. I'm not sure how to spell his last name, but he's awesome. I think he's a, from New Zealand, but he does amazing um, like landscape oils, and they're so good. 
and he does education as well. I feel like though, if I really wanna create at night, um, that's kind of when I'll, I'll grab my sketchbook and I'll do like pencil or, or line, you know, ink drawings. I like to, uh, my husband and I, we like, you know, we like to like watch our, watch our shows at night <laughs> and I pretty much always grab my sketchbook and just draw while we're watching a show. Okay. Slow progress, huh? Catherine says, you follow Andrew. That's awesome. Yeah, Andrew has also like these videos about that are so good about like the golden ratio and about like composition. And they're so good and so helpful. He's a cool guy. And he has a podcast where he talks with other artists and yeah. I um I've been really loving listening to the Emily Jeffords podcast lately. The do it for the po uh, do it for the process. If you don't already listen to her, I really highly recommend her podcast. Um, it's been a huge help for me. She had this one series that really stood out to me, that it was about finding your own artistic inspiration. And um, it was so good. She was kind of talking about like, you know, just like the, the issue that is in the creative world of, of copying other people's art without permission. And it was so good and so inspiring and so encouraging, um, especially for those of you who um, are just really trying to find your creative voice and figure out what your style is. Um, it's definitely a journey. And, you know, I... I definitely learned from other artists and copied other artists when I was first getting started, but it's a great podcast. I th yeah, I think it's called um, Finding Your Artistic Voice from Emily Jeffords, but she's got so many great podcasts, just about all kinds of subjects. So many good ones. I keep switching my brushes <laughs> like I had one designated to color and the other one was my damp brush and I don't even remember which one is which now it happens <laughs> I also have both of my dogs in here and I'm really scared they're gonna <laughs> start making a bunch of noise any second here um, <laughs> Terry says, have you ever dropped your paintbrush on your painting while switching brushes? Um, I think I have. I don't have a specific memory that comes to mind. Um, but yeah, I've definitely like dropped paint on maybe not my brush necessarily, but I've definitely dropped paint like the wrong color, just in you know, a little blob in the corner. Uh, the nice thing about watercolor is if you if you pick it up quick with a clean brush, you should be able to just lift it up pretty pretty well, um, pretty easily. My biggest nightmare that I've ever had <laughs> it was so bad. Um, I I was hired to do a wedding bouquet commission. I think this was back in two thousand eighteen. No no no, it was two thousand nineteen. It was last year. <laughs> it was earlier in the year last year. Um, and my dog came over and sniffed it. Like I had put the painting on, like it was drawing on the gator board. Like it was taped to the gator board and I, I leaned it against the wall and my dog came over and just sniffed it, but his little wet nose, <laughs> it just like moved the color all over like a paintbrush would. Right. And I was so bummed and I tried so hard, but it was like, 
enough time had passed before I saw it that like I didn't quickly jump on it and try and lift that color, you know, and <laughs> I ended up just like painting the entire background, like kind of like a light, light bluish gray color to, to kind of try and mask it. Um, <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> I think it turned out okay, but that was just a bummer. So yeah, that I learned that lesson quick to not put my paintings on the floor when I have dogs. And I'm sure the same rule will apply whenever we have kids someday. Just don't put it anywhere where little noses or little fingers could get to it. <laughs> but anyways, that was the worst and it ended up being fine. It was one of those things where I was like, should I just restart this painting? But I had spent, um, I don't know, eight hours, 10 hours painting. It was a very big and very complex painting and it was terrible. <laughs> All right. So drop more of that paint. Yeah, but that probably is, I can understand how the holding two brushes could seem a little, a little bit daunting. Um, definitely don't want to drop stuff on here. One thing I used to do a lot is when I first, when I was like first getting started, I would always have my cup of tea or coffee like next to my drinking water and I would either dip my paintbrush in the, in the paint water, or sorry, dip my paintbrush in the coffee or I drink the paint water or at least hold it up to my mouth and almost drink it. Um, so now I keep them very far apart from each other. If I have coffee or tea up here, I keep them on opposite sides of the desk. Not worth it. Arena says it's 103 in your country. It's my sleeping time. I love your painting videos. Hope to see more in the future. Thank you, Arena. Thanks for staying up so late to paint with us. I would not be able to do it. I go to sleep at like nine. <laughs> I have like the, I have a very, uh, I'm very weak when it comes to staying up late. I always have been. My sister used to give me such a hard time. Because we would have friends over, like watching a movie at like 10 or something like that. And I would just be like, guys, I, I can't. I'm sorry. I got to go. <laughs> so last time... Well, not last time, maybe it was a couple videos ago. Um, somebody had mentioned to me, maybe a couple people mentioned <coughs> that I should start a Patreon. Whoa, Terry, I totally almost just dropped my brush right then. Wow. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, somebody mentioned like, you should start a Patreon, like, um, yeah, that was kind of all of it. And I've had a few other people mention that to me recently. Um, but I, <laughs> here's what I'll say. I'm not, I, I haven't like formulated this thought very well. I'm just talking. I thought about it and I've like looked into it a lot in the last few weeks. Um, just went on their website and I don't think that I necessarily want to, like I talked to my husband about it for a long time and I'm just like, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with like whether I should do it or not. Um, sometimes it's a little bit exhausting, I will say, maybe to make YouTube videos. Um, and I really love making them. Um, I definitely, I don't know. It's been really special, especially to just receive feedback from people that they're helping. Um, but they definitely are a lot of work for me. So I think I was thinking like maybe Patreon would be a cool way to 
um, make it a little bit more sustainable and actually make, you know, make a living off of it or at least supplement my income with it. Um, so that's kind of all there is to say. I've just been thinking about it. I might end up doing that. Um, another thing I was thinking about potentially doing is opening up my um, schedule a little bit to maybe offer doing like coaching or one-on-one -on -one calls that would entail maybe like um, coaching around like business development or art help or art feedback, website critiques. Um, I basically just get uh, I get quite a bit of questions, especially in my in my DMs. That I'm honestly so behind, uh, just asking me a lot of questions, and I think that YouTube and Michaels have really led to that. And yeah, I guess if I'm just being super super honest, it's been a little bit overwhelming, um, a little bit overwhelming, and I really want to just figure out a way to do it that doesn't lead to me feeling burned out. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because like you definitely want to, I, I mean, I don't know if you're my personality type, but I just want to like give everything and I think that that's going to make me feel amazing. But then sometimes at the end of the day, I'm like, whew, I feel a little drained. And so I think I just need to make sure that I'm doing it in a way that, you know, feels like it's supporting me and supporting my husband and our life. Um, so if you guys have ideas for me. <laughs> Or if you would be interested in any kind of like coaching or if you'd be interested in Patreon, let me know because these are things I'm thinking through and, and feeling a little bit unsure about um, about how to move forward. I think with YouTube, it's so, it's so much fun. Like I love being consistent. This year I've posted a YouTube video, I think like pretty much every week except for the very beginning of the year I was posting on IGTV. Um, but my gosh, it is... It is kind of tiring and it's a lot of work, especially editing videos. That's why doing the live videos is so nice because, um, yeah, I just sit here, film it, and it's done. So no editing involved. But then I end up saying dumb stuff and I'm like, oh, I would have edited that out. But it's fine. Um, so, yeah, just thinking it through these days and kind of just putting that out into the world because I, uh, yeah, just appreciate any feedback you guys might have. Um, and even just like feedback on what kind of videos you guys really enjoy watching, whether it's more like tutorial types of videos or videos that are more about like, um, inspiration, just like, I don't know, painting process or my studio, whatever it might be. Um, I think my most popular video on YouTube is one about, uh, it's the Rose tutorial. I did a 20 minute, pretty in depth, um, how to paint a rose video. And that one's got a few thousand views on it. And then I think the, maybe the other more popular one is, is one I did of a, of a review of a, a Windsor Newton paint palette, paint palette. It was the Cotman set. But yeah, I always appreciate feedback. It helps me to know um, what you guys are appreciating, what you guys are connecting with. Making progress here though. This is starting to feel a little bit more, uh, a little more three-dimensional, especially when I look over at uh, my computer screen over here. Sometimes when you're really close up to your painting, I don't know if you feel this way, but sometimes when I'm really close to it, I just feel like it doesn't look very interesting or good. And then I have to kind of step away from it for a few minutes or just, or even just stepping back a few feet. And then I can be like, oh, okay, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> I feel like I'm especially that way when it comes to doing lettering. Um, I don't share a lot of my lettering on Instagram but I do have a licensing agent and I create a fair amount of lettering pieces uh, that would maybe, you know, be pitched for greeting card companies, stuff like that. 
but yeah, lettering, man, I second guess my lettering like you would not believe. It's so hard for me <laughs> to feel confident about it. I don't know why. Flowers are a lot easier. Quick water drink time. Carla says, I connect with your painting tutorials like this one. Thank you, Carl. Um, I mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again now, but I'm doing a couple of different classes with Michaels in December. We're going to be doing one that's a magnolia, and then we'll do one that is either like a poinsettia or a amaryllis. We kind of wanted to do something kind of Christmassy. So we'll do kind of a deep red flower of some sort and the magnolia which will be a great lesson in how to paint white flowers. But I really do enjoy doing the Michaels classes. Those are super cool. I'm really grateful to be able to, um, to do that. It's just so neat. Okay. So I'm, I haven't looked over at my reference in like a long time. Um, I'm going to pull that up and just, looks like I maybe want to darken some of these back petals just a bit. And then by darkening those petals, it's going to make them look like they're pushed back into shadow just a bit more, which gives us dimension. Messing with values, like dark and light values, is how you create dimension. So having lights and darks of the same color tone is how you create some dimension, okay? And I always kind of, as I start going around in circles, I basically just look for spots where there would be a natural shadow. So if one petal is overlapping another, this one, in theory, should be a little darker. So I don't even really need to look at my reference to know that. I just kind of move around and quickly do that. Just add some of those, some dark, um, a darker value to some of those spots. And it looks like the sun is creeping, creeping over. So I'm going to pull that over just a bit. So I'm just dropping that darker color. I'm going to just kind of do it sort of quickly and move around without doing the, the feathering smoothing technique right now. I'm just going to drop it and then I'll do all of that at once. So drop a darker color and these little teeny petals that are behind the longer petals. All right, then I use my damp brush, smooth it out. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the center of this, um, center of the flower. I'm gonna just reach over here for some Van Dyke Brown And this is just, yeah, you could use the opposite colors on the color wheel to mix brown, the complementary colors, but sometimes it's easier to just use brown. I'm gonna grab a little bit of burnt sienna just because I really like that warm color. All right, then I'm going to start dropping it in the very center, okay? And I'm not painting it on necessarily, I'm kind of more dabbing it because I want to keep some little light spots, just like some little speckles. So just kind of gently dab, dab, dab. Okay. 
Okay. And then I'm going to kind of uh, just reach out into these, uh, do some little spots out into these uh, little teeny petals here. I'm looking over at my reference and I just see that there's some dark brown specks. One of my little tips I like to do is to just kind of squint at it. So if I have a reference, I'll squint at my reference and just kind of helps me to just sort of take in everything, um, like as far as color values and just not get so stuck looking at tiny details, but kind of just take it in as a whole. It's very helpful. So I'm doing my little squint trick, looking over at it, squinting at it, and then it helps me know what to change, what to add. Okay, and then, let's see here. Why don't we, ooh, this is, <laughs> this is tricky. There's a lot of little petals here and I'm not gonna make this perfect. So I'm gonna do kind of an impressionistic um, loose, like I'm not gonna make this super detailed, but I'm just gonna use that same color. And I'm just gonna go in here and just kind of loosely draw some of these little petals, just with that kind of pink, pinky salmony peach color. I'm sure there's a better color term for what that is, but we'll just call it the salmon color. And just kind of drop it in there. Maybe trace, maybe trace them, maybe just draw little dots. It does not need to be super complex. You don't need to be able to perfectly execute all those tiny little flowers. That's just so exhausting. <laughs> but it's awesome if you can. My goodness, some of the Arttober flowers um, artwork that I've seen come through, I'm just like, uh, how'd you do that? <laughs> it's so good. Some people are just so, so talented at all those little tiny details, and it's amazing. I feel like the larger a painting is, like the more um, flowers I have in it, the less detailed I typically make it. Um, just because I, I mean, it's kind of exhausting to just do an entire painting. If it's like more of a study like this, um, and if I had a little bit more time, like I'm, I'm kind of planning to just make this video. I was gonna say an hour, but it's pretty much an hour now. But I try and make my live videos about an hour, so I really don't have the time to like meticulously paint all these little tiny details. But if you ever really wanna practice your, your, uh, your detail painting chops, do just a small study. Don't do, don't try and do a big old fancy thing. Just do one flower or one leaf. Just start small. Bite off uh, a small piece that you can chew. <laughs> don't bite off more than you can chew is the term, but kind of flips that backwards. So do a little teeny piece to study with, okay? Honestly, if you've got the time for, to do all these little petals in this one, if you want to give that a try, this would be a great one to, to practice those little tiny details with. Okay, so I dropped a lot of color around those edges and I'm just going to smooth it out a little so it doesn't feel unnatural. just want to keep it all looking natural and organic. Now I'm going to just loosely smooth out some of those little lines I did. Just to kind of feather them out. I, like I said, I don't like things to look too hmm, painted. I don't know, <laughs> it's not the right term. I don't like the lines to look really hard. I like all my lines to be very soft, very feathered. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, the one ex exception is in this flower, before I'm finished here, I'm going to paint some veins in these petals because um, that's definitely what I'm seeing in my reference here. So I'm going to paint some tiny little thin veins reaching out into the ends of these petals. 
but we'll do that in a sec. All right, so I'm going to add a bit more yellow. I'm going to just drop these little drops of yellow ochre in here. Let's give it a little more interest, okay? It's feeling a little, it always, like I said, it always dries super light, but as I'm looking at it, it kind of looks like the center in here is just white. Kind of looks like it's the color of the paper itself. So I'm just going to drop some yellow in these little teensy uh, petals. Feeling good. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to let all that dry. So let's go ahead and do what, <coughs> what I said I was going to do. I'm going to, um, let's see here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to get another little mixture here going because I'm kind of running out of my salmon color. So a little bit of uh, yellow ochre, a little bit of cadmium red. And I think that's, that's just fine. Okay, so I'm going to, starting up here, I'm using a very thin brush. This is a size two. You could even use a one or a zero. This is a, not a very watery mix, okay? So it's very heavy on the paint. And I'm just gonna use that and just gently reach out into these, uh, the tips of these petals. <laughs> and you can kind of make them bend in towards that point, which is what I'm doing. We don't need to make them all the same, but um, adding these little veins really just like, I don't know, just gives it that extra little, extra little something. Something I might even do is, um, I'm going to just use a damp brush here and just ever so slightly uh, feather that, those lines out just a tiny bit. Because I can't help myself. <laughs> okay. Um, Catherine asked, are you gonna sell these um, arts from your October paint challenge? I'd love to have one. How do you determine the pricing of your artwork? Ooh, hard question. Well, the, I'm not going to sell these ones just because they are all in this sketchbook. And I can't really tear them out, especially because um, the back side of each is like a different painting. And I also, this journal is so beautiful that I would never want to uh, tear anything out from it. So I'm going to keep these paintings, but I'm, I'm making, I think I'm going to make most of them available as prints. Um, which I still, I have like five or six of them up right now on my website, prints from Ar October Flowers, but I'm going to do more. I want to maybe not do all 31 of them, but mm, there's maybe like 25 of them I really like. <laughs> there's a few days where I'm like, mm, okay, <laughs> it's something. I don't know if you relate to that, if you did it too, but yeah. There were some days where I painted something and I'd be like, yeah, I would not typically share this, but it's a good um, experiment. It's a good uh, exercise for me to share things, even if it's not like the work I'm most proud of. And also what's cool is you just never know how other people might connect with the pieces that you don't even necessarily think are your best work. Or on the flip side of that, sometimes I'll paint something that I'm like, this is my masterpiece. <laughs> And it doesn't seem like anybody really cares. <laughs> so it's a good, lesson, good lesson in some humility and just sharing what you create and just being bold, I guess. But, oh yeah, you said, how do you determine the pricing of your artwork? <sighs> I honestly wish I had a better answer for that. Um, it's a little challenging, to be honest. And 
I, I think that the only answer really is trial and error and just putting a price on it. And if it's selling super quickly and, you know, people are disappointed because they can get their hands on one, then maybe your prices are too low. Um, but then also if some, if stuff sits for years and years and nobody buys it, then maybe, you know, maybe prices are a little high, but I would recommend starting a little bit lower and then raising your prices rather than starting, you know, like thousands of dollars and then being like, well, maybe I need to make it a lot less. <laughs> My dog here's Dan. He just came inside the house. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, man, pricing art is definitely a challenge, and I, yeah, I'm trying to figure that one out myself pretty frequently. I, uh, I did an art show once. I think I, I talked about it before, maybe just in like a caption I talked about it, but I did an art show once, maybe like four years ago, three years ago. Um, gosh, and I bombed so hard. Like, I just like sold nothing. And it was all originals. Like it was, I mean, I had prints with me, thank God, because I actually sold some prints. And if I hadn't had my prints with me, ugh, yeah, it was very discouraging because it was like three days and I, yeah, I, I don't think I sold a single original and it was like the biggest art show like in the state. It was in Tennessee. So yeah, it's, it's such a challenge. And I kind of questioned a lot of things afterwards. I was like, man, were my prices too high? Was my art too small? Because a lot of the other artists at my, at the festival, that I, at the, yeah, festival or art show, a lot of the other artists had very large artworks that were about the same price as mine. But also, it's hard because, like, um, if your art takes you, you know, 15 hours to paint, it's hard to just list it at, like, $400, you know what I mean? So it's something I'm trying to figure out myself and hopefully I can get more clarity on the fu in the future, but yeah, I'm there with you. The best advice I always have though is just to try. You just got to start and just see what happens. I always say throw stuff to the wall and see what sticks. For me, I didn't really realize that... Um, I don't know, it's interesting, like, you don't realize, like, what people, um, want, want from you, I guess, um, like, I, I didn't know at first that my art would be great for licensing, and I've done really well with licensing my artwork, um, I haven't done as well with selling original art, but then I've done well with teaching, like, that's something I didn't necessarily expect, but that's worked really well, so you just gotta try some stuff and see what works, see what sticks. I hope that helps. <laughs> There's so many different ways to build a business, build a creative business, no less. And what works for one person is not what's going to work for somebody else. So there's no point in trying to copy somebody else's business model because it's just, it just doesn't work that way. You got to figure out your own audience and your own interests too and your own passions, I guess, the things that you actually want to spend your time doing. We are definitely getting into the home stretch here. I really like how this looks. I don't even know if you can really tell in the video. I mean, it's my video is like two inches. I can't even really tell, but, um, but yeah, these little, these little lines, these little veins, they, I feel like they really add a lot. They make it a lot more interesting. I paint a lot slower when I'm chatty. <laughs> I probably could have typically painted this in like 30 minutes, but that's okay. This was a fun video. I, I enjoyed chatting with you guys and answering your questions. Thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to ans ask me questions. It's a lot of fun. 
I always find that I prefer to answer questions uh, audibly <laughs> than I do to like answer questions like um, if over email or typing. I just like to use my voice because I feel like I can, I don't know. I just like that I can ramble. I don't know. Um, okay, so I'm going to do one more detail for the... <coughs> The, uh, little, the salmon, the center of the flower. I'm just going to deepen some of these uh, pink lines here. I think we need a little more, a little more drama. So I'm squinting my eyes, just kind of, uh, it's helping me just get the whole uh, impression. It's helping me to quote unquote step back when I squint my eyes and not get so caught up in little details. Just for the for the drama, I'm going to actually I'm going to grab a tiny bit of sap out of the what's this burnt sienna, burnt sienna and a little bit of cadmium red. So it's going to be a very dark dark orange color, and I'm just going to add a little drama just by adding some some dark little um, dark little shadow spots. It's just going to create a lot of dimension. Just drama. I don't know if there's a better word. <laughs> I want those really dark, dark colors and really light, light colors. And we do this by painting in layers. We let it dry and then add darker colors. Let it dry more. Add even more dark colors. I'm gonna add this dark color just in here to some of these little, little tiny petals. I like how this is, I like how this is shaping out. That that dark color is adding a lot to me. Okay, I like that. This is the part where I could just keep going all day. <laughs> all these tiny little details. Sometimes it's hard to even explain what I'm doing because I'm just like, oh, I don't know, I'm just dropping little dots. <laughs> just subtly shaping things. I, I've said this before, but I, I sometimes see painting as, um, it reminds me of like archaeology. Because you're using a little excavator and you're, slowly like unearthing um, whatever you're painting. And I've never excavated before, but I watched Jurassic Park, so I feel like I understand. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, digging up dinosaur bones. I'm like, oh, there it is, oh, I see it, yep. Keep digging right there, keep adding those details. All right, I'm gonna give that a minute and let it dry. <coughs> see if there's any questions I might have missed. Um, what colors are on your palette? What are your most used or can't live without colors? Um, I don't think I'm able to, to tell you every color I have right now just because I'm not totally positive, but I can tell you the main colors I use all the time. Um, but yeah, I squeezed like just so many random colors on here that I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know. 
uh, but alizarin crimson, use it all the time, cadmium red, uh, and right here I have, I think this is cadmium yellow or Indian yellow, I don't remember, but I use that color a lot. They're very similar. Uh, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, um, I have a real in yellow, but you can also use lemon yellow. I have sap green, olive green, you can't see, but I have perylene green, Windsor blue, and Windsor violet. And I also have a Van Dyke brown. But go down below, go down below in the comments or in the description, I have what is, it says a list of my fave supplies for beginners or intermediate painters. I have all those colors listed for you with links so you can shop those really easily. Um, but yeah, those I pretty much need all those colors. I mean, it's hard to say that there's one I need more than others because I use them all pretty frequently. Um, but yellow ochre, burnt sienna, yeah, I use those ones a lot because I really like to desaturate my colors a bit. And I typically will do that by adding a tiny bit of warm, like browns, yellows. Um, what else? Uh, I'm slow at drawing and painting still since I'm learning. Did you experience the same? I'm slow at drawing and painting still since I'm learning. Um, yeah, I definitely did. Definitely did. Don't, don't be hard on yourself for that. That's okay. It takes time, it takes a lot of practice, and I know that I'm, I'm a pretty quick, um, I'm a pretty quick painter and drawer, so I never want people to feel discouraged if you're not keeping up with me. Um, but yeah, it just takes some practice, and honestly, going slow, like, there's, there's a lot of beauty in that. I think you're able to really enjoy your process, and I don't know, just yeah, kind of are able to really see what you're doing and focus and slow down. And I think that's great. So don't even worry about that. Take all the time you need. The more you practice, the quicker you'll become. But honestly, there's some times where I just feel like painting very slowly just because I'm enjoying it. So no worries at all. And Catherine, thank you for your genuine answer. You're right. You're, you're right. You're welcome. Uh, Catherine asked me about uh, determining the pricing of my work. So, okay, let me give this feels pretty dry. My, uh, my paintings dry quickly because I live in New Mexico and it's just so dry out here. My palette is always, it's like bone dry constantly. I'm always just like, tss, tss. I use a squirt bottle and I just keep it wet that way. All right, so I'm using my bloom eraser. Man, but it's just lifting right out, you guys. I'm telling you, that F pencil is where it's at. And this paper really helps too because this paper is so darn smooth. Um, this mixed media paper, it feels like hot press actually. Very smooth like hot press. If this was cold press, it's not as easy to erase if I'm being honest. Just because that texture of cold press, it's, it's hard to lift all the pencil markings. But no worries. It is all good. If you have a painting with a little bit of pencil markings, own it. It's cool. <laughs> it just makes it look like a human made it. Okay. Time to... This, this er these erasers, they leave a lot of debris. Just so many little, little crumbs everywhere. All right. I'll hold this up for you. There we go. Our finished daisy. And if you painted this along with me, gotta let me know. Gotta post it on Instagram. <laughs> or just at least send me a picture of it so I can see it, okay? Um, thank you guys so much for joining. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. I'll see you guys next time, okay? <laughs>